the, the derivative, the total derivative. So write it like that. So total derivative of the map sigma max del sigma is the derivative of in composed with the derivative of f. So um, that's kind of growing up advanced calculus notation, but, but I think it's kind of slightly more conducive, if you don't want to give a name for this f, um, that we could think of um, the following thinking of, we differentiate sigma, uh, lambda sigma with respect to sigma, so it's like the lambda sigma by the sigma times delta sigma, because you've got to say what, what, what direction the perturbation's in. So that operator applied to F2, that's how you work it out. So okay, I, I actually call this dF in my notation, the total derivative. Um, and so, um, let me um, perhaps coin a notation that, that makes the u depend on the f. That, that might be a little bit neater. In other words, um, let me um, let me define g d. GD is a, a kind of Green's function that solves this problem for specified Dirichlet data. And of course, in, in real life, we solve those finite elements, so it's got a finite element matrix that does this job. So it's, it's really nothing mysterious, it's something that you know, we could calculate quite easily. But I, I just wanted to write that down <coughs> so that I could say, um, so that I could say that this, is delta sigma grad gd sigma f1 dot grad gd sigma f2. If you spread back, it's probably not great. Just to see the f1 and f2 in that dependence. In other words, you get f1 as three clear data, you solve it, you get f2. And then um, the reason for that is that we actually want to specify Neumann data. How do we do this? Well, um, we, we just compose with, um, with the inverse. So um, what we get is that d lambda sigma inverse by d sigma, in other words, d r sigma by d sigma, is um, it's just going to be minus and then okay that was formula for inverse and um, and so um, what I'd like to do is to take two currents J and I'd like to work out J1, dr sigma by d sigma applied to delta sigma, J2, J1 and J2 are my sort of test currents I'm going to put in, and that's J1 minus lambda sigma inverse
So um, that, that's all applied to delta sigma. Um, so that would be minus delta sigma And you'll see that GD, lambda sigma inverse, J1, is um, uh, is just a solution operator for the Neumann problem. So, in other words, if you get some Neumann data, J, J for current density, you do... Neumann to Dirichlet, you get the Dirichlet data, and then G solves the Dirichlet problem and gives you U, right? So GD is, uh, applied to lambda sigma inverse is the operator that takes Neumann data and solves it rather than Dirichlet data. So um, what we've got is that the, the sensitivity for Neumann data is, is actually, um, so we can write it, J1 times delta U2, on the boundary, is equal to minus the integral of delta sigma grad U1 dot grad U2, where, it, now these are the solutions of the Neumann problem. Right, so L sigma UI is equal to zero, but sigma Ui by the n equal to Ji, the, the Neumann data that. And, and in fact, in this case, U2 is actually the voltage that's really there if I apply the current pattern J2. And then if I've applied that um, current pattern, I then want to measure the voltage. And so I choose J1 to be however I measure the voltage. You see, this is the voltage on the boundary. And I'm just going to slap two electrodes on and take the average over this electrode and the average over this electrode of the voltage and take the difference between them. So uh, a typical choice for J1 would be, let me sort of draw it in one dimension, function like this, where um, you take the average over one electrode minus the average over the other electrode. Because you tend to measure the voltage between two electrodes, right? In that case, okay, so, so here's something as a reality check. I kept the current constant. If I increase the conductivity, then the voltage at the boundary goes down. So there's a minus sign here. Whereas if I did the other way, if I fix the voltage, increase the conductivity, the current will go up. It's got to be one way around or the other. You might have to think about it a minute to, to check that, that you agree with that. But the point is they go the opposite way, hence a minus sign here. Okay, so what we've got in the end, and I just sort of run out of time, but how do we actually construct a linearized forward problem? Well, actually what we, we get is a system of electrodes, um, possibly different ones for current and voltage, but in any case we've got a system of electrodes, we apply a bunch of currents, maybe in one out that one, in one out that one, stuff like that. Um, and those who are, in this way I've done it, J2s. We get a voltage, the U2, U2s, and we look at the voltage differences on some electrodes, see how those change, that's my delta U2. And then I sample that by choosing J1s. And if you had a forward sample that was a finer element code that's able to solve the Neumann problem, then for each pair of drive electrodes, or each pattern of drive currents, you solve the forward problem and you get U2. For each pattern of measurements, this kind of reciprocal thing here, like this pair and that pair and this pair, we, we, we solve the Neumann problem for U1. 
in, in, um, in medical physics, they call this the lead field, and in other areas, they call it the joint field. And then to calculate the, the derivative of the voltages we measure with respect to conductivity changes, we have to work out these dot products of gradients. And it turns out in finite elements, this is really easy, because dot products of gradients are exactly how you work out finite element matrices anyway. So it's kind of the ingredients you already have to hand. The only thing that you have to do is decide how to represent your conductivity changes. For example, constant on elements would be easy, or, or some other basis. And then you work out all these things, and that gives you a matrix of partial derivatives of voltage measurements that you actually make with respect to adjustable conductivities that you've made in your, in your model of conductivities. And so it's a, this is a practical way of working out what's often called the sensitivity matrix for an EIT system. And the same methodology, with, with slight differences, uh, holds for, for any kind of Maxwell's problem where you've got a perturbation in conductivity or permittivity or permeability. So you still get a, a related sensitivity formula. And then what that gives you is for each set of measurements, the J1 to J2, you get a system, you get a linear equation for delta sigma, and so you've got a system of equations for delta sigma, and you solve that system of equations, it's a linear system, you get delta sigma, you add it to the sigma you had before, and then you can do that again, iteratively, until you, you, you change your conductivity and it fits the voltages. And so that's the basics of, of ERT reconstruction. It, the, the next step that we need to consider is when you have a this linear system, it's actually desperately opposed and just solving it with backslash and MATLAB or something like that just won't do. So, so you have to do something a little bit fancier than that. But uh, the, the basic ingredients are there. Okay, so um, there's um, a, a couple of possible homework questions. If sigma was complex, um, so if uh, instead of sigma, you have sigma plus i omega epsilon complex, and then the voltages are complex as well, in other words, it's alternating current with angular frequency omega, uh, does this still work? Or in particular, there's a few adjoints lying around, where do they go? <laughs> is, is, is actually the, the point to it. So it's worth, um, it's worth going through that exercise. Um, and um, the other thing you, you might like to do, just to see if you can do perturbation calculations like this, is that you might try and get this formula starting with the Neumann problem. In other words, rather than doing a Dirichlet problem first because it's easier. And, and actually, uh, to make this easier on yourself, you might just assume that delta sigma is zero near the boundary, because then that loses a term and makes it a bit easier. But um, you, you should sort of be able to more or less reproduce that argument, what you can see. Uh, I like I like this way, it's kind of elegant because you get both and then you can compare them. Okay, so that's it.